do appreciate the time you're taking today uh, to spend with uh, myself and Francois from, from Copy Datum. Uh, so my name is Doug Bonanno, um, the, the global sales executive and, and sales leader for uh, Cognos Analytics uh, for IBM. Um, and I too have been around a long time from a product perspective. I've been with the product since 2008 when IBM purchased Cognos um, and have been with the product, uh, product ever since. So uh, I have clean, uh, clearly seen the evolution of Cognos from where it was to where it is today. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, before I pass it off to uh, to Francois to give you uh, kind of a demo of of, of what Cognos, uh, where we are today, uh, which is a long way from 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 where we've been, but I think that uh, what, what I'd like to do first uh, is really spend some time um, not just talking about Cognos, but uh, to kind of share our views um, on the application uh, of AI within BI, right? Then give you an overview of of, of CA. Um, and make it more relevant and see why it's relevant today. Um, then I wanna kind of tie in, you know, the thinking behind AI and BI and the design principles and how that uh, applies to the product today and kind of lead you into what, what Francois is gonna, gonna show you. So uh, one of the things that we did this past spring, right, is IBM and O'Reilly published uh, a new report called the value of uh, AI-infused business intelligence, right? AI, uh, O'Reilly is a you know a thought leader. They've been around for a long time in the tech space. You know their mission is around you know sharing technology, uh, sharing you know technology knowledge and, and teaching. Right? It's to you know us as professionals, uh, the education industry and the tech industry in, in general. Uh, we've done multiple projects with them. Right? So Mike Norris, who is uh, our IBM director of uh, of offering management uh, for Cognos, has been with with Cognos and the product. Uh, for, for 20 plus years, uh, he authored the report, and it's really about his and IBM's expert point of view on the importance of AI, right? And, and how to become more relevant today in kind of the evolving BI landscape. Uh, what's interesting to note is despite the, the technology being around for a long, long time, you know, you still have the, the lead analysts like Gartner and IDC, you know, they still say this industry continues to grow at about a 7% pace annually. And that has been true for as long as I've been with the product, um, and I do expect that to, to continue. Um, but future growth is not going to be around traditional BI. It's really going to be around, you know, AI-infused uh, business intelligence, where we kind of, you know, take BI to the, to the next level. You know, when we talk about AI and BI, I do want to make a distinction. It's not about, you know, artificial intelligence. It's really about augmented, augmented intelligence. And I say this a lot when I talk to um, to customers and, and just people uh, in general about BI, right? We're not trying to replace an activity. We're really just trying to enhance a process, right? Or make a process quicker, faster, you know, stronger. It's really not about replacement. And that's really kind of kind of key here. Uh, it's important to, I do think, to bear this in mind when we discuss this through, throughout, the, throughout the talk track, um, because it does show how we've chosen to implement the product and bring the product to market. Uh, I'll pause for a second because I don't know if there's a delay in, in the Zoom meeting with the slide change. Um, so let's talk about uh, you know uh, game changing. You know, uh, game changer is 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 a term that is you know um, very overused, right? It, but it's appropriate when we discuss AI and BI. I think if you apply it correctly, you know, it definitely has the ability to transform business because it allows users to discover data-driven insights in their domain without really requiring that specialized data science uh, experience, right? And we all want to be a line of business enabled user, not so much a data scientist enabled user, right? You know, I think our, our line of business users today, you know, want to stay in a, in a secure and governed IT architecture and still have that ability to explore data, right? And they don't want to be able to, to have the worries of, of corrupting things um, that others are doing, nor, nor do the, the people that kind of manage these systems. You know, if I look at AI technology, you know, it definitely takes, the, you know, takes advantage of the power of natural language. It, it, it's learning from user interaction, uh, it customizes and personalizes insights, right? When we discuss the, the, the AI today, we talk about, you know, uh, the term artificial narrow intelligence. But as we move to tomorrow, it's going to be more of a strong artificial intelligence where it's about planning and learning, the ability to communicate well in natural language, even make a joke, 
Um, if you've ever seen, you know, most current demos of uh, recent demos of AI technology, I think it's interesting to see how freeform you can get with natural language in applications today. Think of that practical application in analytics. You know, and finally, you know, on this point, AI plays a role also in, you know, data cleansing and preparation. Data used to, you know, that can take, you know, hours and days to prepare, you know, with AI, it can take, you know, minutes. Why? Because we're allowing the application to do some of that pre-work for you. So, you know, a, a giant leap, a giant leap in AI is absolutely machine learning, right? As I said a minute ago, you know, AI and BI is around augmented intelligence because the underlying technology is augmenting versus replacing. And I think that's, that, that's very critical, as I mentioned before. Um, I have, I've, we've had debates when we've done seminars uh, around, you know, augmented versus replacement technology. Um, and it is important that uh, you kind of put that into perspective, right? While machine learning is kind of the underlying technology of AI and BI, right? AI models, you know, identify things on its own. So you provide input, it comes up with its own rules using that data. There are many advantages to this, and clearly it's definitely a massive time saver. But, and there's always a but, and you can't have a presentation without a but, um, one of the biggest concerns for, you know, execs today is that AI is a black box. You know, I, I think that, you know, we, we don't give enough credence to, to transparency and how an AI model arrived at certain output, right? And it definitely makes, makes uh, for some concern um, at, the, at the executive level uh, and uh, is definitely legitimate. But if we look at AI and machine learning to be explainable and transparent, you know, there's clearly a requirement to continue investing in data science and, and, and experts, right? So while some of it is black box, we do have to continue to look downstream and the trend is how do we make sure we make it more relevant, right? So that we kind of dispel those myths. So what's the future look like? If I, if I look at today, I mean, I do think the future is, 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 is bright, right? And we see uh, a few directions here. Um, one, an evolution, an evolution towards domain-specific models, like natural language. Understanding something that's tailored specific to an industry, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, et cetera, um, and, and, and so forth. So bringing that domain into the application. You know, real-time social analytics, you know, the ability to track a, an online conversation and sentiment about a product and company image right in the middle of a, uh, of a new campaign launch, right? Um, we we'll also see that BI tools are starting to act, uh, act as kind of an archive of institutional knowledge, right? Because of the ability um, to, uh, to store data today is, is greater than it's ever been, the BI tool becomes that, that natural archive. Uh, and if I look at that, it's like AI loves data and the breadth of historical data just really enhances the use case. You know, and, and finally, you know, if we look at uh, the, the potential of, of cleansing, comparing, and doing more analysis and unstructured data, uh, again, we can, we can continue to add uh, and augment, you know, additional automated analytics by bringing that unstructured data uh, into the fold. You know, it's not just for, for large enterprises. Um, and, and I think this is, a, again, very important to note. You know, I, as we come out of our, uh, you know, I'll say our, our new normal with the COVID-19 pandemic that has really kind of hit us all really hard, you know, requirements for analytics, you know, will continue to, uh, to scale and grow. They will probably take even maybe some, some new tracks, uh, some of which we may not expect yet, right? You know, a large enterprise is going to struggle to how to right size an organization. A small company is going to have to focus on how to kind of optimize their operation. One of the things that we've seen recently in the last two months um, is, you know, the, the, the surge of customers that are coming to us as a, as, a, as a BI vendor saying that I need to add resiliency, you know, into my analytics platform, you know, how do I do that in, in the cloud, right? And get all the great things that cloud brings because my workforce is now transforming. I really need to have my deployments transform and transform faster, right? So, I'm going to kind of pause there from an AI perspective, right? And that's uh, kind of a high-level summary of the O'Reilly report. Um, there is a link in the in the tool if, uh, in in the presentation that that uh, the Francois will provide. 
Um, and uh, you know, please take a minute, take a look at it, and we'd love to hear your, you know, your feedback on it. So let's shift gears a little bit and, and spend some time now uh, and talk about Cognos Analytics. You know, if you've been to a, an IBM presentation, um, you've probably seen our, our talk about the, the AI ladder, which is really nothing more than you know, how we've organized our products to, to come to market um, and our roadmap and design thinking and our principles in each one. Well, from a Cognos perspective, right, we sit kind of top of the AI ladder in this infuse rung, right? And, you know, we, we, we look at the, the, the infuse rung um, as the key spot for us, you know, for a couple of reasons, right? Um, and, and, and the one I'd like to point out is that the ability for us to take analytics that come out of a platform like Cognos um, and, for lack of a better term, infuse them into the operational, uh, operational aspects of our business is key. Right, and that is where we we shine. So a couple a couple of uh, key points that um, that I would share share with you here as I as I kind of uh, lead into the product itself. You know, if I've only met your needs today, am I am I already behind? And do I have all the answers I need in one place? Right. Two things that I think is if we point out in advance that you know. If I'm all, always looking in, right, if I'm trying to meet today, if I'm not thinking forward, right, and if I'm only dealing with today, I'm absolutely not pre prepared for tomorrow. We know business intelligence has always been a kind of a in the rear view mirror um, approach to analytics. Tomorrow's approach to analytics has got to be what's coming, not what already happened. So our goal is to allow a, get and provide you a platform that will give you those answers in one place address historical with strength, allow you to think about what could have happened, and then potentially show you what will happen in the future. So one of the things about Cognos, and uh, this is a bit of a built slide, um, it has been around a long time. It's got a strong, rich history of innovation, right? Where we started way back when, when Francois was young with uh, Impromptu and PowerPlay and ReportNet, right through today with Cognos 11.1, um, which when it, when it got released for the first time in, in the late 2018, was truly the first AI-infused BI application on the market. But what's not lost on that is that it still brings the, the, the long proven platform strength that we've had for a long time, right, that really seals for us the ability to provide that true governance and security that's required for, for today's BI platform. So if I think about, uh, you know, BI in general, one of the things that we always talk to customers about is how you think. If you're going through the thought process of how to answer a question, address a problem in everyday life, your tools should kind of do the same thing. So when we think about analytics the way you think, I look at it from, you know, starting with, collection and organization of the data and the criticality of that, right? If we look at, uh, from, a, from a Cognos perspective, you know, we've put in um, automated data preparation technology that's, that's driven with natural language, automated modeling, um, embedded da uh, uh, data preparation in, inside the application to do what I talked about earlier, which is, you know, to make it easier for people like myself to bring data in without having to rely on IT all day long and not make it cumbersome as if using, you know, full grown detail tools. But once I start to collect, I do kind of have to address what's going on in the organization, right? My, my job is I'm addressing hundreds of questions all day long, but I need to distill that down. I really need to get to, to it, an insight, something that I can create actionable, or at least bring to my executive team of management to say, these are the things I've uncovered, right? Which ones are, are most important for our business that we should look to operationalize, right? That's where data exploration comes in, right? And that's really where AI shines, right? So from a Cognos perspective and some things that I'm sure that Francois will show you, you know, we've embedded an AI assistant, you know, we've enabled true advanced pattern detection. So you can see what you may not have thought of, right? Kind of the, kind of the unknown, right? Um, we put predictive capabilities into the, you know, into the platform, and we recently added time series forecasting. So it allows you to take a look at questions you're trying to answer and see what tomorrow would bring. 
and decide whether or not you want to put that into kind of a KPI dashboard or whatever. But downstream, it is all about becoming actionable, right? Um, and you have to be flexible there. So from, from creating dashboards, right, with automated visualizations, natural language, handling open source, uh, collaboration and storytelling, all critical to, you know, a, a, a true dashboard deployment to manage reporting, right? Something that Cognos has done for, for quite some time. Well, from a managed reporting uh, uh, standpoint, we'll give you the guided layouts in advance. So letting the data help you decide what's the best way to present it. And then finally, how do you go beyond BI, right? Going beyond BI to uh, kind of infuse into your uh, organization, things like Jupyter Notebooks, Python, planning analytics, et cetera. So with that, I mean, um, as, I, as I close and hand over to Francois, a couple of, couple of uh, final points, right? One is, it's really about data preparation, data analysis, the ability to create and share, and then infuse into your organization, right? And then from an IBM perspective, we really want to make the ability for you to kind of deploy the product any way you want, right? Right from our, our free trial that's available today um, to client hosted, our Cloud Pack for Data platform, which we released this past year, um, and our IBM hosted cloud and on-demand cloud service. So that flexibility. So with that, Francois, I am going to uh, pass it over to you. I think I need to stop sharing and open uh, and, and give the control back to you. All right, I'm gonna reclaim host. So hopefully you'll give it back to me. That should have worked. All right, so I am the host now. I'm gonna start that polling so you don't have to um, answer now, but I would love to hear more about you guys. Um, so I, I think the polling just started now that I'm the host and I'm gonna share my screen. So hopefully uh, somebody can tell me if there's anything not going as planned. Uh, share my desktop. So thank you, Doug. Uh, I only have one slide before I get into the live demo. Um, actually, hold on. There you go. This one here. And it's a, much, a little bit of my perspective on why, you know, what is different with Cognos, not only versus previous releases and old generation, but also um, versus what's out there in the marketplace and, and kind of link it to some of the new features as well. And then most of them I'll be showing you. Um, I think I think what's unique about Cognos Analytics is it's unique lightweight. It's totally web. There's no desktop involved. Um, most of the vendors out there that I've seen, and some of them are do amazing capability and you know empower the user with with great great features. But a lot of them require a desktop experience. And if you don't have it, then it's kind of limited. And if you do have it, then you start on the desktop and you move to the server, and then it becomes web, which is fine too. But it does bring some um, governance and deployment challenges in large organization and sometimes even in small organization. So that's one of the unique, uh, I think, differentiator of, of Cognos Analytics. Um, we also have columnar storage and caching. That's something that I feel there's no, I, I do a lot of, you know, migration with customers and I help them out with adoption. And if for some reason they still, you know, a lot of them are still in the old framework manager and the old metadata packages. Um, mentality and part of it is it's the challenge of migration of course but we do have columnar storage and caching for fast performance self-service against large data sets um, most of the vendors out there have it as well and they call it something else but we have the concept of storing on the server not on your desktop uh, a columnar uh, database for fast performance and any type of, you know, slice and dice and drill down and, and filtering you want to do while you're exploring a dashboard. The, um, the user experience, I think, is a lot more engagement focus, um, meaning it's really guiding you. And, and the power of Watson and the AI that was injected really helps in, in, in achieving that. But I feel that you can really not only put a story together, but also be part of, you know, exploring into building that story in an engagement fashion. Um, the, uh, like Doug mentioned, code-free AI, you don't have to import uh, R uh, or Python, although you can, but you really can inject a lot of AI in, into your analysis and, uh, and also, uh, you know, look for predictive outcome and pres prescriptive insights. 
governance. Um, as you know, Cognos has been around the block for a while, uh, and governance has always been one of the key um, pillar of its um, of its platform, and it's still out there. So it, everything is governed. Whether you you want to you know uh, you want to change a data set, add a new data source, which I'll show you in a demo which is something we want to empower the end users. However, there needs to be some governance. If not, you're back into the Excel world where everything's on your desktop into multiple you know, files that you own. So that's something that I think uh, IBM will always uh, keep as a differentiator. We just got to be aware of it. Um, enterprise reporting, let's not forget that. Uh, most of the demos that we do start with uh, dashboarding and exploration, but at the end of the day, 80% of the needs are still operational reporting. Um, and, and it's important that we keep this. Uh, we can, we modernized it, but it's the same, you know, foundation metadata, same, same reporting. Um, you can import Jupyter notebooks, like Doug said, that's more advanced. I'm not going to show that today, but you know, if you have um, algorithms and notebooks um, that you have used and are still using, you can embed it into your analysis with Cognos. Um, Custom charts, schematics, I'll show a bit of that. That's great. I mean, there's a lot of charts out there that are, you know, open source and third parties. And you want to use them in Cognos so that you don't wait for the next nice chart that IBM will provide as part of Cognos. So those can be imported quite easily. And I'll cover that a bit. Uh, integration with budgeting and planning. Uh, as you know, IBM has an entire portfolio and the integration from Cognos to budgeting and planning is you know, is embedded and it's, uh, it's seamless. So that's an important factor so that you don't have, again, you know, everything is about the life cycle of decision-making and budgeting is part of it. Um, data preparation, not an additional tool, not an acquisition, part of Cognos. I'll show you a bit of that. Um, and once you deploy Cognos or use or migrate to Cognos Analytics, it's uniform. It could be on cloud, could be hosted, could be hybrid, could be on-prem. It won't change the assets. You don't have to redevelop anything. You don't have to add any components if you move from one, one, uh, you know, one to another. And it's cheaper. Uh, we didn't want to hit you guys with uh, pricing today, but uh, there are uh, amazing uh, promotions out there, uh, and you can use Cognos for as low as I think fifteen dollars a user. So uh, feel free to reach out via follow-up email uh, through the uh, through the event link, and we'll, we'll share with you some of those uh, free trial and promotion. Um, it is cheaper, so um, cheaper than ever, and cheaper than the, the the competition. All right. So having said that, I'm going to switch to my um, Cogno screen and start with a dashboard. Of course. Um, it's always a nice way to start, very visual. Let me know anyone, uh, Stephanie, if, if the screen's not full screen or if it's not, uh, it's not adequate for the, for the presentation. Um, okay, so, you know, I wanted to, I didn't know what use case to use today, but I, I said, you know, uh, membership, uh, subscription. This is something that with the COVID-19 crisis is as important, you know, companies who have it, they're doing okay. Maybe not amazing, but they're doing okay. And companies who don't have any type of membership retainer or special club or MVP, they wish they had one because that's in this COVID-19, it's really one of the best way to keep, keep, keep your customers and retain them and keep in touch, right? So I, I picked that, that topic because um, I think across industries, everybody wish they had uh, some kind of subscription or, or membership services. Um, and you know there's a few metrics that are very important to to such a business model or such an offering and it is churn versus tenure you know i mean you don't want to lose your customer you want to keep them as long as you can you want to know how much they bring to the table as far as contribution um but and you don't want to lose them or maybe you want to let them go if they if they're if they cost too much which happens in some industry sometimes but um you know this is an, a dashboard that shows me um Maybe I'm in marketing, maybe I'm in customer service, maybe I'm in uh, sales and operation, and I just want to make sure I retain my members and I know their lifetime value as well. And I'm going to just, na I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, the basic of navigation of a nice self-service dashboard, you know, and you, you click on something and it, it, if there's another widget, that's how we call it. If there's another widget that can uh, be, a, you know, filtered by what you clicked on, it will, it will change. Um, you know, I brought a lot of data source in there, so not all widgets are, are talking to each other, but 
you know, one thing you'll notice for those who have used Cognos 11 and maybe not the latest release, we now have a lot better control over our font size and our real estate. So you can, you can pretty much cram a lot more um, information and visuals into one, you know, one screen. Uh, and you can make it a lot more, you know, like some of the, the desktop tools out there, which gives you that ability. Took time, but you know, of course, keep in mind, this is a web experience only. There's no plugin required to, to build such a dashboard uh, and no desktop required. So uh, we are, we're overcoming the web, you know, HTML5 or the limitation of a web browser um, slowly, but it starts to look really, really good. Um, other things you can do, I can do in this dashboard is I can, you know, interact with it uh, even more. And one, one feature that Doug mentioned, which I, I love, is, you know, IBM injected some of the SPSS or Watson capability to give you a time series forecast, uh, which is just, a, you know, a switch that you can click on here and want, and you have some parameters that you can, uh, you can adjust. But if you don't, you know, you sh just by clicking on the forecast button, you already have uh, a decent number of future time or future periods based on how much history that you have, right? And it will also, you know, if we click on or hover your mouse, it will tell you the confidence level of this particular um, node that you clicked on. And you can see when you click on that, of course, the confidence uh, kind of broadens over time, meaning, you know, it's less confident as, as you add more months, which is normal when you have a limited set of data. But this is a great way to, I think, uh, initiate some users that may not be data scientists. I'd like to call them global data citizen. That's kind of the new hot term, but you know, I want, you know, it's a good way to, to uh, introduce them to, to, to the predictive uh, analytics and more and more data science driven uh, exploration. Um, so I could do this uh, all day long. I can, I can click on this chart it already has some forecasting here as bars. Same thing. If I hover my mouse, I will see the confidence upper bound and lower bound. So again, very, very easy to integrate um, predictive uh, modeling to, to their data as long as you have a time series and it's been dragged to, to, the, to the visualization. Now here I have a map. Uh, one of the new features of 11.1.6 Cognos is that you can do categorical coloring on maps, which is what you see here. Uh, the data that I had wasn't really that relevant to show you a really good example, but you know, it's, it's, it's very good. The, what, what you can do here is you can apply a non-numerical value to a region or, or a point, and it will change the color based on the categorical value, right? So if you have a larger concentration of, in this example of, uh, I think I'm filtering this by, let's look at another color here. Yeah, some offers. You see, this is offer C. If I click on here, this is offer B. So on top of regional boundaries, like zip codes in this case, um, you have you can add categorical values to color those regions. So it's pretty cool. But again, it, it's kind of kind of a third dimension in the map. And I can zoom in, uh, and then you see those those circle numbers are actually clusters uh, because you know there's many values. So as you zoom in, those clusters disappear. Um, and, um, it looks a bit like a COVID map here, but you know, you can, uh, you can look at the hot spots. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, you can also search for a particular zip code. I already searched earlier to see which one I would want. And let's say I pick this one, it's going to focus in and zoom in, uh, this zip code. So, you know, map is getting more and more interactive, um, which is great. And here, what I want to do is give you a bit of a, what happens usually in real life when somebody navigates a dashboard. They want to see the detail, right? And you know, we could do detail in the dashboard and have a more of a tabular table like you see on the left side, but why don't I connect this uh, and pass the filter to a report? And intentionally, I picked a report that looks old, like the old Cognos for those who are, are as old as I am. And, um, you know, it's a, this is a traditional report build the, with the reporting tool, um, but I added a feature that just came out in 11.1.6, which is called a data table. And if you click on those fields, you're gonna see that real fast without querying, it's opening up with expand and collapse, you know, my data. Uh, and I think this is a great feature. Um, it was part of, you know, in the older release, Cognos 10, you could do this with an active report, but now it's really part of the, uh, the HTML rendition 
of your uh, of a more traditional tabular like report so it allows users to you know filter up and down and uh, and sort and do a lot of different you know great and filter by the way i didn't even know you could do that i just noticed that's great but be able to filter in the report so it makes the report even more interactive than it could be and this report is an old report that i've had for years and all i did is i converted the data into a data table so very easy to do and, and i think it's a great feature so i'm going to subscribe to this report um, which kind of you know this is more of a traditional enterprise reporting feature but it's needed uh, i'm going to say okay i want this report delivered tomorrow uh, some, uh, yeah, the, it's the format that I want. If there's a prompt value, in this case, there is one that could say, I always want to see the zip code or multiple zip codes. So you can, you know, create personal prompt. And once you create this, then, um, you know, it's going to alert you when the report runs again. And the alert button is right here. I see a little bell here. So, uh, just traditional. I wanted to just open a parenthesis, which show you a little more of traditional reporting. So let's go back to my dashboard. I'm still an end user. I'm not a, you know, a modeler or data citizen. So let's switch at and, and, and become a data citizen here at this point. I'm gonna click on the edit button and I'm gonna add a new tab. And what I wanna do is I wanna focus on new data that I have. And the data is not available now in the dashboard, right? I see here, I have my churn data. I've got uh, demographics, uh, all membership stuff. But I, I did a survey last week where I'm asking my members how they spend their lockdown time at home because I want to make sure that I, you know, I give them offers and promotions and email communication that are relevant to their lifestyle in lockdown. Um, so I'm going to keep that open and I'm going to switch and the purpose like, you know, like a cookbook, I, I'm gonna do this quick, uh, like a cooking show, but I'm already now, as a data citizen, I'm allowed to go back into the data model that is supporting this, that, this dashboard, which is a very simple model, as you can see here, and I'm allowed to expand it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a new data source. Not everybody will have the capability to do that, but I don't think you, know, you need to be a database owner either. I mean, this is just something I can do from my, from my, from my uh, computer on a web browser. So I'm gonna add data right here on the spot. I'm actually gonna upload it. Um, and let me go back to my desktop here. I have my Excel spreadsheet, which is all my survey data that I may have uh, grabbed from uh, SurveyMonkey or something. And I'm gonna upload. Now you see that I already uploaded that data before. So do you wanna append it with new values or you wanna replace it? I'm gonna replace it for this, for this demo. So, there's not a lot of rows in there, so it shouldn't take that long, but it, it's, it's, it's not only uploading it, but it's analyzing it also to make sure it recognizes time versus categories versus measure. And now it's warning me that it's there. So I got my new data set right here, right? And you can see it's alone and lonely here. Um, and I'd like to join it so that I can, you know, I do have a membership ID, which I think I can join, but let me review and make sure that, uh, the AI here did a good job. Uh, it did pretty good except for two, the MVP number and the age. You see the icon here says it's a measure. It is not a measure, so I need to change that uh, to identifiers. Very easy to do just with the property button here. I also noticed that the job searching metric, for some reason, it's probably because the way the data was presented or maybe there was an outlier as a null value. Well, I'm gonna force it to be a measure, no problem. And finally, I'm going to select all my measures here. And instead of total, I want average time per day or per week. This is weekly data. So I'm going to do average instead of total, which again, if I had more data, AI could have probably guessed all that, but this is a limited data set. So it's probably not enough for AI to figure out that it should be an average based on the, the broad range of, um, of, of values in there. So uh, now that this is done, uh, I think I'm good. Uh, I'm going to join this guy and this guy. Whoops. Let me make sure I select vote. And I'm going to create a relationship. And, you know, again, I could spend more time on, on the join issue here, but typically a, a, a casual global citizen user is going to know two fields that are named alike or very close, and it's going to join them and match the column, and then make sure maybe with the refresh button that the data comes back. 
as expected and there's no duplicate row. So this seems to be pretty good. So I'm gonna click on okay. Now I have a join between my master file for my loyalty, you know, membership data, and then I, I'm joining it with my survey data. Um, what else can I do here? Um, well, you know, I see that I have a date here and I, if I open the data, it's gonna show me how the date looks, looks like. It's all daily data, no problem, all the way to probably May of this year. Um, what I'd like to do is, you know, one of the big challenge of dashboarding and data modeling is a simple issue. It's be able to look at comparative relative time, like right? year to date, month to date, quarter to date, last 12 months. Everybody wants this. And it used to be easy when we built OLAP cubes because we store it in a cube. But now, uh, now with OLAP cube, you know, slowly phasing out, um, it's, 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 it's one of the most basic thing, but it's challenging for a modeler to do it. So here, what we have is the ability to add a calendar that's already built and comes with the install of Cognos Analytics, and it comes fiscal or uh, Gregorian, sorry, my French here, and uh, you can actually uh, edit it if you want to, but I'm just gonna take one out of the box, because you, you can have your own custom calendar, and I'm just gonna add it to my data model. Now that it's added, and you can see that it's hidden, it's grayed out, which is fine, I don't need to touch it, it's an out of the box calendar, but what it allow me to do now is to click on my date and assign it to look up to the calendar, and automatically the tool knows that it's gonna join the date with the date field, um, as long as you have a date field here, which I do. And, and then the next thing you do is you pick the measures that you would like to have those relative time category on your dashboard or compare with. So I'm gonna pick count, I could pick uh, maybe the most important, uh, you know, maybe how much television time you spend. You could do it for all measures. Now keep in mind, the more you do it, you know, the more the data module expands and of course it could, it could impact performance, but you know, I haven't seen any performance impact because uh, it's all metadata at the end of the day. But once you did that, simply you can open the measure and you see those are the ones that come out of the box. Prior month, prior quarter, prior year, current month, current quarter, last year, same month, year to date, blah, blah, blah. And you can do it for any, any measure that you want and it will also apply to generic survey dates as well. So you can do those comparative. You know, and those will show up just before the month. Those can be added as a filter for any type of report or navigate or, or, or dashboard. So great feature <clears throat> that, that is very easy to do. And uh, all I need to do now is, is save my data module. I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna wait till this tells me that it's saved. And once it's saved, go back to my dashboard, typically, the minute you reopen the dashboard, it would automatically refresh with those values. But since I already have the dashboard say, uh, you know, open, uh, what I need to do is just relink to it. Not very hard. You just got to look. I know where the, you know, where the uh, where the data module is, and now it's relinked to it. And what it's going to do is refresh and make validate and refresh my dashboard, you know, based on the new model. And if I click on the new model here, I can see. Uh, you know, all the added data. So let's go back to my survey data here, which is empty, my survey tab, and maybe do a bit of personal modeling too in my dashboard. Everything I did so far, as far as modeling was in my data preparation tool. Now I'm gonna do it straight in the dashboard and it will be tied to the dashboard uh, for future. Um, so let's start with creating, let's say, where's my data, right here. So from my survey data, I have an age range here and I'm gonna create a data group from there. So keep in mind, I'm still on the web browser and I'm in my dashboard. I'm gonna create something called age group. I'm gonna create a new group called uh, zero to, or actually under 40 and pick those three fields. And you guys have seen that before in Cognos and other tools too, but again, I'm in the dashboard, it's live. I'm not a modeler at this point. Um, I'm gonna create one here called 40 to 60, uh, and this will be those guys here. And then instead of creating another one, I'm gonna make a remaining group call over 60. And I should cover everything, right? If something else comes up, then uh, I don't, it's, it's quite weird. So I'm gonna create the group here. So the group will be part, not of the data model, but off, out, out of my dashboard for future, right? 
you can see, oh, I already created one earlier. So uh, in my in my dry run. So I guess that's the new one right here. I'm going to delete one of the two to make sure there's no confusion. Let's delete this guy. Okay. Um, so now I've got my age group here. And from the age group, I'd like to call, I'd like to create what we call a navigation path because I want to be able to drill down from my age group to my age range to my age. So I'm going to call this age and I'm going to add uh, my, my, my age group first. And I'm going to add my age range and then my age. So it's just a nice way to, to create some drill down capability out of my dashboard. So I don't need to bother the data model or whoever has access to the data module, right? So now I have, and, and the term that we use is, is a navigation path. So now I'm going to start populating my dashboard with three columns. Uh, let's see, I'm going to select the age. And then how much time they spend per week on food and drink preparation and how much time uh, they spend on television. And I'm going to drag and drop this into my, um, my first here. Now you're going to see that um, I don't like this chart personally for, the, for what I'm trying to look at. So I'm going to change this to a cross tab just because I want to see the numbers, be able to ranking and stuff like that. That's much better. Now, one thing I want to show you is a new feature called AI learning. Every user, um, for every user, Cognos Analytics is kind of taking notes of the behavior of the user and their preference. So if I, if I, um, let me say dashboard, if I delete this now that I, you know, I said I preferred the cross tab. If I delete it now and I drag it again, I hope it's going to work, but it should build a cross tab. There you go. So it gets smarter over time on how users like to behave with the data, which I think is great. So now if I bring my age group and my count into another widget, then, you know, because they were all joined, I can drill down, of course, um, because I created the navigation path um, or I can, you know, I can, uh, I can filter and whatever is on the left is going to filter as well. So anyway, just uh, another, another set of good features, easy, easy to understand, easy to use. Um, and, uh, you know, it's part of 11.16. Um, now let's get into, let's get, you know, if I'm a global data scientist or a global data citizen and I wanna explore and bring some AI to this, um, you know, you may need a little bit more training or more uh, adoption uh, within the organization to make sure they use this. But let me give you a few examples of using um, more advanced analytics. First, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag a chart, but this time I'll pick a custom chart. So one of the features of CA is to be able to embed custom visuals or custom charts such as D3 or Google charts. Um, I personally like the D3. It comes with a few examples. That's an example of a D3 chart, uh, which is called a sand key. And the sand key is basically a, you know, a show you a pathway or an evolution or um, a concentration of two different categories. So if I say, okay, I want to look at, um, go back to my loyalty and churn. I want to see, uh, let's say, let me, hopefully I'll find it quick. Uh, yeah. From their status, you know, their MVP status, which is membership status to how much they respond to my promotions. And I want to see, you know, just, just the, the count, whatever metric you put in there. And it's going to, render this custom viz, um, hopefully, and show you the pathway between the MVP status and the promo response. It usually doesn't take that long. All right, well, we'll see. Oh, there you go. And you know, it's, this is a D3 chart. You can download it from the web and embed it at Cognos. It's not hard. Uh, you may need to be an administrator to do it first, but once it's there, it's, <coughs> it's available for the user. Then I'm going to go into a little more advanced territory here and bring a chart that I like to show in my demos called a spiral chart. Spiral chart sounds scary at first, but what it is, is a chart that shows you for a particular metric, what influenced that metric to behave. Uh, or in other words, in the data science world, you know, what is the predictive strength of other categories of measure against that measure? And the measure that I care about here is how long do I retain my customer? I know it's in there somewhere and it's called tenure. I'm going to drag this over here. 
So what the spiral chart is going to do, it's going to think a little bit and it's going to show me all the factors and drivers that are affecting this. And the closest to the target is, of course, the number one. Now, one thing that makes sense is renewal. Of course, renewal will have a predictive strength that is higher than average on my tenure because if they renew, then they stay longer. So I want to take it out of scope. So if I click on edit scope here, I can look for this renewal field or driver and take it out of the equation. So now my spiral chart's gonna rethink for a second and it's gonna be probably a lot more insightful for me because you know, renewal was a no brainer. If I hover my mouse on those drivers, I can see uh, the higher the percentage, the better. But what's interesting here, I'm noticing that average monthly revenue is as a big impact. So the more they spend, the longer they stay, which is great, right? It's, that's a good thing. I can see churn being an impact, of course. I could have removed that as well. That's a no-brainer. But what's interesting here, I see preferred, um, preferred transaction, credit card versus you know, checks versus bank account, also has an impact to 75%. And transportation, which is one of the offer that we have, um, if they want a, you know, a, a transportation promotion, is also a big one. So that's something that I'm curious about. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to clear this and bring those columns to a new widget, all right? I'm just gonna pick them up. So, uh, let's see, where is it? Where's my tenure, 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 do, do, do. Okay, there you go. So I'm gonna pick my tenure here and I'm going to uh, drag with it um, prefer transaction method and I'm gonna pick, uh, what was the other one? Uh, I'm sure some guys are saying they know. All right, I'm gonna pick this guy. I'm gonna drag this into my chart. And let's see what it says. Okay, it's a bar chart, that's okay. I can live with that. Uh, but there's another field that I wanna analyze and it's transportation, which is just a flag whether they like, you know, they use our transportation promotion or not. So I'm gonna look for that field right there. I'm gonna drag that as a filter, okay? I'm gonna make it a, uh, a yes. Click OK. So now I'm looking at uh, my tenure versus my monthly revenue average for transportation. I could keep filtering back and forth and explore further, but why don't I use AI to help me do that? There's a button here called Explore. I'm going to click on New Exploration. Not every user is going to get into that unknown territory, but those who are curious, um, such as Global Data Citizen, they will. So now I see the same chart. And I see a lot of insights here that I may not know. Some of them are obvious, but some of them I may not know, like the average you know, value for tenure. Um, some other correlations here with a predictive strength is showing me here. So there's a lot of trend here that I can discover just by reading this uh, natural language that uh, Cognos Analytics is presenting to me. Um, but now, you know, this is for, uh, this is for filtering uh, transportation. So let me compare with uh, transportation equals no. Um, now, it's already, and this is the engagement part I was talking about, right? So it says, how do you want to compare? Do you want to do a, compare to a totally different chart? Do you want to compare side by side and then start you know, modifying the chart? Or, hey, I noticed that you have a filter. You want to use inversion and just see compare, you know, transportation, yes versus no. That's what I want to do. So it's gonna show me the, the two same charts, but with the two different filters applied. And I like this feature here where you can sync a baseline. And the minute you reach a certain value, I, usually uh, you're gonna see that value pop up as a pop-up box. So you can start comparing you know, what affects uh, a certain measure. And there's a lot of other sync uh, factors that you can enable here. They're all here, they're all enabled now, but you, know, you can do further analysis this way. Um, and everything that I'm doing, by the way, is saved as a story deck, which so that I can present it later uh, or, or keep it to bring it in, you know, into my dashboard. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do that shortly um, by clicking on this. You know, those are called badges. And when I click on a badge like this one here, it's going to give me other insight that is found that are more correlational insight. And it's telling me, hey, you should also look at hotel. And I didn't know that, right? In the previous chart, hotel wasn't there. Maybe it was lower down. But at 70% confidence level, I think there's a relationship between the revenue and hotel and transportation and the preferred transaction method. So I'm going to click on that. 
Now I'm getting into a little more advanced again, right? It's an evolution into data science. But I'm looking at the predictive strength of all my measures and drivers as it affects tenure. Still focusing on tenure. And here is a bubble chart over time, over a certain range of revenue that shows me the concentration of no versus yes. No, by the way, being the empty bubbles and yes being the full bubbles here. So if I click on this guy, which by the way, everything I click adds another slide to my deck here. I can then focus on maybe just this, you know, this is my highest revenue, highest tenure, very important customers for me, right? So um, I think, uh, well, let's see. Uh, usually I can click here and select them. That's not a big deal, but you can do, you can do filtering just on the, on the actual, maybe I just click on it to wake them up. Yeah, there you go. And you can just, you can click on the value that you want to concentrate to, which is my upper, upper range revenue versus, you know, longer range tenure. I may be also intrigued by here, which is by the way, all non-transportation, but they're, they're not bringing a lot of revenue and their tenure is low, right? Maybe the sweet spot is right here. But anyway, just to show you how, how it works, it's great. Now, I like this chart. I want to re reuse it. I'm going to pin it to my environment. And then pinning is, is just saving, basically, for future use so that I can um, you know, bring it back into, into my dashboard. So I'm going to go back to my dashboard. And just to circle the loop here, um, you know, this chart is OK, but not meaningful anymore. <laughs> And I'm going to go to my pin objects here and hopefully this will show up. There you go. And drag it over here. So now I just expanded my dashboard with a chart visualization that I believe is much more meaningful. Speaking of which, I'm going to go into a little more of a, you know, speaking of engagement, I'm going to ask Watson, I, I like to call it Watson, you know, whatever his name is, and say, okay, show me, uh, let's say, show me churn by, um, total revenue oh, oops. So, and see how much revenue I'm losing by, you know, with churn. So this is all, you know, interactive. Uh, it's going to recommend some charts. I can click on this link, which will recommend more charts. Uh, there's some chart recommendation if I prefer it sideways or bubble chart or radial chart. So it's, this is super interactive. I could, I could keep going and ask, ask uh, the assistant or Watson, uh, more question in a chatbot type of environment, or I can say, you know what, I'm lazy. Uh, create dashboard with churn, which is one measure I cared about. Uh, the other one was uh, tenure, which I cared about, and uh, customer lifetime value, another measure. Just click on that, and I promise I should start my webcam, but I'm not touching anything now. I'm watching the screen and stretching and stretching at the same time. And, you know, this is great. It's, I mean, how casual is that? You can have a nice looking dashboard, of course, the charts are big and, you know, it's a simple dashboard, but it is relevant and it's separated the measures, you know, with different tabs and it's showing me uh, maybe some more insight or something maybe to bring to upper management if needed, or I can change all those charts if they're too, uh, if they're too simple. But again, being able to create a dashboard from a command um, and if I would have added more commas and more measure, I would have had a lot of more tabs and I could have added dimension in my, in my verbiage as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's really powerful. I think, um, I wanted to show you one more thing that is totally not relevant to this use case and this data. Um, and it is the, uh, capability to use SVG file or, um, SVG diagrams or schematics. Uh, it's a great feature that was incepted, uh, two release ago, but, I think it's going to be used by more and more companies now. And to do that, I'm going to create a new report. That's just going to take two minutes. Then we wrap up with, I'm a little over time here, but uh, it's, it's Doug's fault. So I'm going to click on blank here and I'm going to uh, add an object. Um, and there's two objects here that you can play with. One of them is the schematic and the other one is the custom visualization. So now keep in mind, I'm in a reporting tool now. And by turning on the preview, it's going to allow me to select such schematic. And when I say schematic, if you guys have played with SVG before, uh, it's basically a very simple image technology that has data as part of the code, right? So you can put data references in the code. Any SVG that you right click and open on your computer, you're going to see the code in Notepad. 
and you can assign data elements to it. Not the actual data, but the elements. So if I click on, I have a few examples here. The one I'd like to use is the one that I think airline companies are gonna use under COVID, which is a C chart, because they're gonna have to eliminate middle seat, I heard, uh, and maybe it'll be one airplane per, per passenger, but anyway, we'll see. Um, and now I've got the, um, the schematic here, and um, I think that's the right one. Let's see, I'll, I'll know as soon as I bring data. And I'm gonna select the data source, which I know I have in here, which only simple four fields data. And I'm gonna drag this. I'll know if it's the right file now, because there's some file I had that was not, uh, there you go, yes. So you see now that I added the seat, which is by the way, I could have shown you the data. It's very simple. It's the seat number, the type of seat, and then it's occupied or not, and then profitability per seat. And then if I drag a measure into my SVG chart, it's gonna color it and populate it. Now, think about airlines, they need this. Think about concourse, think about now office space, now that they wanna do social distancing. Um, there's gonna be a lot of planning. And if you can analyze it this way, I think it's great. So I just brought back this topic because I thought it's so relevant to airlines uh, under this uh, new norm, which hopefully will be temporary. Um, so this is my demo. Uh, it was recorded. Um, I hope this was helpful and beneficial. And I'm gonna switch back to um, my main screen here and see if I can, there you go. Look, uh, if there's any question, or I think there's ways to chat and question in, in, in Zoom, but, uh, or you can unmute your, your microphone if you have a question. Hopefully you won't all do it at the same time, but chat works as well. So we got uh, just a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes max to, to uh, answer any question, or it could be with a follow-up email as well. Go ahead, anyone. I have a question. Yes. Um, are you planning to do all the recommendations of the AI in other languages other than English? The recommendation of the AI what, sorry? The exploration, uh, basically. Will it be supported in different languages and not just English? Oh, wow, that's a product question. I don't know if Doug, you can answer that. I believe so. I think we're still, uh, I still, we're still multi-language. Are we, Doug, as far as the exploration is concerned, or is this on the roadmap? If you're still there, Doug. Actually, I don't see Doug here. Yeah, he yeah. is. Yeah. Um, I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm still there. Um, that is a great question. It was on our roadmap. Um, we should know the answer to that. And you, you're thinking about for Explore? Yeah, for Explore. Yes. I'll see if I can get an answer while we're still on the phone. If not, uh, Lil, I guess you can send me an email or send an email through the invite and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get an answer to that. I'm curious to hear as well. Okay, thank you. All right, any other question, anyone? But that natural language curry you did uh, was very good. Does that come standard with Cognos 11? Yes, uh, it comes standard in the explore mode. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. If you have access to explore mode, actually, if you have access to even the, the assistant, you know, the, with the typical uh, analytics user license, then you get all that out of the box. Yes. Hi. Any Hi. Is there any plan to add the feature similar to the uh, workspace we had that you can drag some objects from reports to dashboards so, uh, so or so? Ah, yeah, I love that too. I'm totally with you there. Um, I don't know. That's also a product management, Doug. If you, I do have my perspective on it, but Doug, do you know if you'll be able to drag report objects into dashboard like in the old workspace days? Or is it on the roadmap? Yeah, it's not on the short-term roadmap. Um, okay, but I'll, I'll tell you what I do now. Uh, yes. You can, yeah, thank you. But you can still use the pin feature to share, as you saw. And that, I did a project where we used the pin feature as widgets. So everything that was pin was a widget library and users like that. Uh, the only downside to that approach is the, the, uh, the objects are not reporting object, they're dashboard object. Can you, can you explain again? What you did? Yeah, what I did is I, if you saw in my demo, I used the pin feature, you know, when I pin one of the chart that I liked. So 
if you want to give your users access to a set of widgets, like, like the workspace days, create a bunch of pins yourself as an administrator or a model or whatever your role is and make them available to, to the users. Um, and that's going to allow them to, to bring, you know, uh, pin. Now there's, there's some challenges as far as user capability and user security, but that's an approach that has worked in uh, some environment where I, they wanted to have a pin and, you know, they wanted to have widget libraries without using the SDK. Any other question? I'll take one more or two more maybe. Hi, this is Sahaj Jyoti. So is there any plan to bring this speech recognition technology in Cognitive Analytics? Can you speak uh, further from the microphone? Thank you. Yeah, I am asking that uh, speech, speech recognition technology will be enabled in Cognitive Analytics. You're still distorting. Sorry, I didn't hear the technology you're talking about. Uh, do you say it again further from your mic or? Yeah, this I'm talking about speech recognition. He, he's saying um, speech recognition. Oh, gotcha. Well, that's okay. <laughs> it's kind of relevant. Uh, speech, speech to text, Doug. Any, is that on the roadmap as well as far as when you interact with the assistant? I think it is. I think I saw that it was. Yeah, I don't know the answer to 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 that from a time frame standpoint. It's not in R seven, um, but speech to text is in a, in that in our roadmap for. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I don't All right. Know. Well, I'll take note of it, um, and uh, we can we can do a follow up update. Any other question? I'll take one more. All right. Well, I mean, please, um, you're going to get an email from us on the uh, survey, <laughs> and then we'll do the next demo with that, but also um, on the offers that we have for trial and for exploration of Cognos, as well as um, pricing. I mean, we want you to give it a shot if you haven't done already, and uh, look for an email from us. Thanks for attending. We had a great audience. Stay safe, stay home, or if you go out, uh, just go out. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll uh, be in touch with you guys soon. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you.